can't use an old map to explore a new world. Hey, warm welcome to another exclusive interview with uh, global leaders for our People Matters community. My name is Esther Martinez. I'm the CEO and Editor-in-Chief at People Matters. And I have the privilege to welcome today for our conversation, Jeff uh, Swartz, VP Insights and Impact at GLOAT. Uh, very warm welcome, Jeff. I am really delighted to be with you today, Esther. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'm looking forward to it as well. So Jeff is uh, also Senior Advisor at Future of Work for Deloitte. And as I said, BP Insights and Impact at Gloat, which is a talent marketplace platform that is reinventing work and careers in global enterprises. And he's also an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School. So we're gonna to talk to Jeff today about many things, but one is of course, uh, celebrate his, uh, the publishing of his book, Work Disrupted, and you can see it in the backdrop as well, Opportunity, Resilience and Growth in an Accelerated Future of Work. So tell us a little bit about the book, Jeff, before we start with uh, questions. Oh, thank you, Esther. So um, as you mentioned, I, I had the privilege of helping to create and lead the Future of Work practice at Deloitte Consulting, which is pretty much what I did from 2016 to to 2020, 2021, and um, we saw the world really unfolding in front of us. And um, then COVID happened, actually, where we're, we think we see the light, hopefully, touch wood, that we can see what the, the post-COVID period will, will look like. And I had been um, putting my thoughts together in writing a book on, on the future of work um, based on our experience with companies around the world, which was fantastic. And um, when I was I was finishing the book in the literally in the spring of 2020, we had committed to send it to the publisher Wiley in uh, June, early July. And so then we had three or four months, Suzanne Reese and I, my, my co-writer, to put the book in the context of COVID, which we're very grateful for. Um, I, I feel a little bit for people who publish books in January of 2020. So we had a chance to to put it in context. And the, I can summarize the book this way. Um, uh, the book is called Work Disrupted. It is not called Work Accelerated. Um, we have been accelerating work based around technology for a long time, really since the 1960s when sort of Gordon Moore postulated what we, we all refer to as Moore's Law, that technology effectively doubles um, every 18 to 24 months or halves in price. Um, and so we're like 30 turns into that doubling. Um, but something else happened in the last year and a half. Um, and, and when I say that work, workforces and workplaces have been disrupted, um, we were challenged to really shift our thinking, right? And that's, that's the, those are the two comments I'll make to maybe help frame the discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll give you two quotes that I'd love for us to talk about. Um, one is a quote from Albert Einstein, who said that you can't use an old map to explore a new world. And I think that we are in a situation today as HR and talent and business leaders where we're trying to figure out what these new maps are and these mental models. And we can't really continue to use 20th century models for 21st century careers and work. And then, and, and then um, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the president of a think tank uh, here in the US, called um, New America said, and she said Esther in March of 2020, the end of March, we're a few weeks into it in the US, but a few months globally. And, and um, Amory's comment was that the coronavirus and its economic and social aftermath is like a time machine to the future. And things that we thought would take five or 10 years are taking five or 10 weeks, and in some cases, five days. Now we've all lived through that, as I like to say, you know, um, we are all futurists now because we've seen elements of the future, but it was the shift and the disruption that I think is really central to what we're thinking about. And so what I explore in the book is how work workforces and workplaces have changed. What does that mean for careers, for organizations? What does that mean for leadership? And then what do we do about it as individuals, as business leaders and as society? So obviously you can tell I'm very excited about it. It was very timely. And I also, I mentioned to you when we were getting started, um, it was just released in German um, uh, in August. So we're very excited about that as well. Uh, but before we start, let's get into this definition of future of work. And, and as you said, that's a 
a, a term that you've been passionate, you've been working very deeply with even pre-COVID and that future of work, going back to your um, comment on the time machine, the future of work is here. It's not future anymore. So tell us a little bit more about what, what does this mean if you could declutter this whole concept of future of work? What are the different dimensions? What does it really mean? Yeah. So it's a, it's a great question because there is, there is a fair amount of clutter and there's a fair amount of, of noise. And I, I think it's absolutely fair to ask the question, um, is, is, does it make sense anymore to talk about the future of work? Or are we talking about uh, work in the 21st century, right? Or work in the 2020s or the 2030s? And I think where we are now is we are talking about work in the 21st century. And, and the reason we're talking about it is that work in the 21st century, the future of work, has three components. We talk about it all the time. We At Deloitte, one of our partners first postulated this idea in 2012 in Australia, and it's been popularized and picked up by many people. And, and one of our partners just as nine years ago said, look, what we're really talking about is how work is changing, how workers and the workforce is changing, and how workplaces are changing. So for nine years, which is a long time now, we've been talking about the future of work, the future of workforces, and the future of workplaces. And one way to think about it is, how do I frame work today versus how I might have framed it 20 years ago? How do I frame workforces today? And how do I frame workplaces? And I'll give a very brief example of each, right? Um, the two big dimensions of work that are changing is we are moving from a focus almost largely on efficiency and scalability and productivity to work not only focusing on output, it's not only how do we do more of the same work with fewer people, which is the definition of productivity. There's no other definition. Productivity is more of the same output with less human input, right? Um, but we also know that we need new outcomes. We need innovation. We need new services. We need new impact that we're creating. So how do we look at work, not just from a cost and an efficiency perspective, but how do we focus on work from an innovation and a growth and an impact and a meaning perspective? The other part of work that's dramatically changing is the way that people and machines work together. Right? We could spend the entire interview talking about this, but it's fundamentally changed, right? And part of it is automation. Part of it is how we use technology to substitute for labor. But one of the world's great economists, Darren Asimoglu at MIT said that um, AI and uh, in many ways is the worst form of, um, uh, sorry, the a a um, sorry, what, what Darren Asimoglu said was one of the, the worst forms of AI is AI as automation and AI as substitution. What we're really looking for is how we can put people and technology together in new combinations yeah. to augment the work we do, to augment the work that teams do. And at Deloitte, we talk, we've been talking about super jobs and super teams as well. So work is changing from output to outcome and from doing a job to doing a super job and a super team. The workforce is changing because the workforce used to be your employees. And today, roughly, there's about 3 billion employees in the formal sector. Um, um, but if you look at most companies, the average company has two thirds of their workforce are employees and one third are in this other category. There may be consultants, they may be contractors, they may be gig workers. Um, they're part of an ecosystem. So how does how is workforce changed? And I don't have to spend much time to talk about how workplace has changed because the workplace used to be where we went to do our work. And now, of course, in many, many cases, we're working in many different places. So it's work, workforce, workplace, but moved into what's possible in the 21st century. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, when you were talking about technology, one of the things we've also seen is that while technology was available uh, pre-COVID, I think the how organizations across different industries, even at different velocities of um, maturity, of, of really accelerating the, the use of technology. And I love your point about also about super jobs and super, super teams. How do you see now that we're going into this, you know, 21st century phase, as you mentioned, 
um, how do you see the tech enable movement and how is it going to combine with the you know even more focus on people centricity and human uh, approach you know, how 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 do you see these two forces coming together yeah so um it's 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 a really interesting question Esther and um you know before covid when we talked with business leaders and employees about the future of work the 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 top question was the relationship between technology and workers since covid it's been the office and hybrid and we'll come back to that so but that, we've always talked about work work versus workplace but you know two or three years ago we 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 started every discussion with uh with with this question is the future about the robot apocalypse or is the future about humanity unleashed right and of course there are elements of both of them at play again you can tell I'm a little bit of an economist this is why we talk about creative destruction we know that there will be tens of millions of jobs that will be lost we know that there will be hundreds of millions of jobs that will be created the real challenge for all of us is the way that i would put it personally and for you as a business leader is all of us should expect that our jobs and our work will change number 1 and they will change in a way that we are all working with and next to smart machines and robots right So what we're trying to think about today is what's the version of the work that I am doing where I am teaming with other people, diverse people, people all over the world and with technology. Right? And I I often joke um uh I think it's technology that people may recognize around the world in the US, we have an automated autonomous vacuum cleaner called the Roomba. Right? And I am not threatened by my on autonomous vacuum cleaner because when my vacuum cleaner is doing the vacuuming and cleaning what it gives me is the gift of time right and i think that's part of the essence of what we're looking at here which is if we can give our employees more time to do the things that we can uniquely do as humans right if we can focus on our human enduring capabilities and allow machines to do the things that machines do well right we create a really interesting opportunity and i think where we're going now is looking at how people and technology work together together and thinking about what we can do as humans right and and my we talked earlier you said you were in barcelona um i was i was mentioning to you that one of the great things i love about barcelona is that the picasso museum is there or one of the great picasso museums and pablo picasso amazingly said um that computers are not that smart because computers only know the answers and what we really are interested in are the questions right right and so that's an example the ability to frame a problem the ability to manage people the ability to um uh an- analyze um a problem the ability to have social and emotional um intelligence the flexibility that we have um with the human body to do things that no one else can do and the ability to create and imagine and and have um empathy i think will become more important and how we combine our human skills and our technology skills that's really i think where we're going in the 2020s it's one of the places we're going wonderful thank you so much jeff thanks and connecting it with uh, your first uh, insight reflection about the definition of work workplace worker changing Uh, I think many organizations are now trying to define what is this return to workplace or return to work uh, concept and you mentioned about hybrid uh, a few minutes ago how how do we, do we define these interconnections between work worker workplace um as we try to define this you know new way of uh work in the 21st century tell us a little bit more about what you hear and what you see and what the opportunities are Yeah, so this these are this is one of the huge questions that's in front of us. It's in the business press and the business media every single day, every single hour. Um and I I'll uh, you can tell I'm very excited about our conversation. I'll try to highlight two points here. Um one is that what we have seen dramatically in the last year and a half, 20 months is that work and workplace are not as interdependent and intertwined as we had thought. 
right? And I, you know, I talked a few minutes ago about my book work disrupted. And one of the big mindset shifts we're going through is actually separating the work that we do and who does the work from the workplace, because it used to be the workplace and the work operating model were the same thing, right? I work in a bank, right? Which means that I go to the bank, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting behind a desk, I'm sitting behind, uh, I'm a teller, I'm sitting behind the counter, um, I'm a security guard. You sort of know who I am, what work I'm doing, and the workplace, they were all intertwined. Whether I work in a factory, I work on a campus, I'm a teacher, I'm a nurse, or I'm a doctor, I'm in a clinic, we can all visualize it. What we were looking at before COVID, but what we were stocked into seeing during COVID was that it was as if somebody pulled the rug out from under us. And the rug that was pulled out was the physical place, All right? And now we were asking ourselves, at one point, half the world was doing their work, but they weren't, and they used to do it in the one physical place, but now they were doing it the way we're having this conversation, right? Um, and, and this is a dramatic shift. And we've seen an, a tremendous amount of what is possible, right? That's number one. Again, I think we sort of pulled the physical workplace out and we were, I think, amazed at how much we could do in the virtual and the remote world. Now, did we like it? Did we not like it? Are there social interactions we want to spend more time on? Of course. I think the other aspect of this is when we, uh, is, uh, as you know, I, I, I think how we frame the question is really, really important. I don't think it's about a return to work. Um, I think we get to choose as business leaders and HR leaders and employees and workers, what picture we have of the future, right? Has the last year and a half, has the last 20 months been a detour? Well, you know, did we get off the main road and were we driving on the side road and now, okay, it's okay, we can get back on the highway and continue to go where we were going at the speed before, or, have we actually rerouted and we're going in a new direction, right? Obviously, you can tell my point of view is I think we have rerouted. And I think companies are asking the question today, what combination of hybrid work makes sense for us? And I'll, I'll summarize it this way. The question is not how many days a week you spend back in the office. Right? As Linda Gratton at London Business School says, the question is, how do we do hybrid? How do we manage work, workforces and workplaces where some of our workforce are in the office most of the time, some of them are in the office part of the time, some of them are never in the office because these are people that are from all over the region or the world and to get the diversity that we need, we want to have that type of global network and access. So the question is not how many days we're in the office, but rather how do we manage a hybrid workforce? going forward. And I, and I think we've seen this, I'll, I'll make one other comment, hopefully it will make sense. Um, about six months ago, uh, we've all been following the pronouncements of, of the large global companies who say, our policy is uh, three days a week in the office, two days a week at home. Our policy is nobody needs to come back. Pretty much what almost every one of these companies that made a pronouncement six months ago has been updating their pronouncements, right? because we are learning together what our employees want and how to make hybrid work. And I think that's really the frontier that people are focusing on. Wonderful, thank you, Jeff. And I may uh, ask, add one comment and, and seek your opinion as well. And I think maybe a question is also, what are we going to office for? Because I think a lot of times then we see people working from home in the office. And then it just seems like a bit surreal that we're actually going to office, uh, you know, to get into Zoom calls because not everyone in our teams is in office. And, and you may wonder, what, what, it, what are we going to office for? And maybe focus a lot on what you mentioned uh, of, of social interactions and really going to that physical space for something which is not, you know, being in front of our laptops. What would you say about that? Well, I, I, I think the question is spot on. I think it goes to the heart of what we're talking about, which is, um, I think if I were to generalize, and I am generalizing, we learned a couple of big things over the last 18, 20 months. One was that a lot of the work that we used to do in our cubicles and our offices, that we can do at home. If we have a home place to work, which not everybody does. So there are there's some real equity and access issues around technology. But, but that we don't, you know, the work that we used to do in the cubicle, we can do at home. 
we actually found that we were more productive because even even with kids and dogs and and, and noise <laughs> around us, we could control our schedule, right? Which was which is very powerful. But we did miss elements of the physical social interaction. Um, but we didn't miss it all the time, right? And, and so what we're I think what we're trying to figure out is how much time do we need to spend not necessarily in an office, but in a communal workplace, right? Right. Yeah. To go into an office that is largely cubicles doesn't make a lot of sense. To go into an office, I mean, our office at Deloitte, I used to work in the office at 30 Rock downtown. You know, one of the, we have a half floor that to me looks like a Starbucks, right? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a lounge with coffee and couches and, and, and high top tables and if people are coming to the office for social interaction, we need to build offices for social interaction, right? So we are we are seeing companies sort of not clear away, but in some way reconfigure um, cubicles and offices to create communal and uh, collaborative space and social space where they are continuing to invest in having offices. Uh, in cities and towns. And I think we're going to see more of that going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, you were mentioned that we saw uh, ourselves be more productive, we can control our schedule, but we also saw some uh, side effects of us not being used to working uh, without that physical break of, you know, having to commute, coming back and finding it more difficult to probably have the discipline to stop and that leading to maybe additional burnout or additional um, pressure on well-being and, and just taking the Deloitte 2021 report that talks about well-being today not just being a side benefit but just you know something that we deliberately integrate into that three combination that you were talking about work workplace and, and work uh, worker uh, so tell us a little bit about this the focus on well-being which is something different from the pre-pandemic time uh, I think I think that's right, and I think we've seen a shift in the last again uh, year and a half. Um, we've been all experiencing three crises simultaneously: um, a healthcare crisis, an economic crisis, and a social crisis. Um, uh, and that's a lot. We've all been through a lot, and we're still going through it. And, and I think one of the things that we learned, and this was part of what we were observing and exploring when we were doing the 2020 and 2021 Deloitte um, trends research, was that, you know, if we looked at well-being a few years ago, well-being was considered almost a side benefit. Can we get, you know, does your company offer access to a, to a, to a gym? Does your company office um, offer, um, um, uh, uh, you know, allowances to buy um, uh, physical equipment, that that sort of thing. You know, does your office have a gym, right? Um, uh, and I think the shift that we saw was that um, during COVID, our, our personal lives and our work lives were really intertwined. I mean, we're having this interview, you know, typically I'm, I'm actually at, at the GLOAD office today, but, you know, nine days out of 10, when I'm working, I'm working from my dining room table, right? So our personal lives and our work lives have really been um, intertwined, right? And um, well-being has really moved from being a physical office safety issue, which is what well-being was like, health and safety in the office uh, a few decades ago, into what is your physical well-being? Are you healthy? What is your emotional well-being? What's your mental health status? What's your financial well-being, right? And I think the other piece that we're seeing now is that employees are telling us that in addition to their physical health and their emotional health and their financial health, they are looking for what I will call cultural and value alignment as well, right? People are saying that they want to work for companies that reflect their values and what is important. So this reframing of, uh, of, of, of well-being we're seeing the combination of well-being and purpose in many organizations, right? This is one of the big shifts that we're going through, right? And again, it's not a side benefit. It's not a sideline. It's my health, the work that I'm doing, how it fits in with my life, how it fits in with my values. We, we can argue that we think that that's the right thing or the wrong thing, 
But I think that this is the trend that we are, we're seeing, and that's leading employees to say, we want you to see as an employer our whole lives and all of our challenges. And it's leading us as employers to say, are we really thinking about what are the considerations and the expectations of our workforce? And this leads, and I hope that we can talk about it, to the mismatch that we're seeing around the great resignation and the great reshuffle that's going on, because I think that's one way this is playing out. Yeah, so let's stay there, uh, Jeff, before we go to a couple of more dimensions that I want to cover with you. Um, so tell us a little bit about what's your uh, reading of what we're seeing as people call the great resignation, great reshuffling, and how is that probably an opportunity for organizations that may see that that's a signal for this, uh, as you say in your book, you know, the work disrupted, and you, you can actually yeah. see it as an opportunity as opposed to um, seeing people going to as other places. As a threat, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I, I, I think one of the things we have in common, Esther, is we are, we are looking at the world and where some people see threats, we are trying to frame them as opportunities. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I think that's a very healthy and constructive way to look at it. Yeah. So we've seen some very interesting data, not just in the United States, but around the world. We actually had an incredible data point that came out this week in the US, which, which I'll mention because I think it's a good indicator of what's happening. In, in August, 4.3 million workers in the United States left their jobs voluntarily. It's the highest number since we've been recording labor statistics. The previous high number was 4 million in April, and that's when we started talking about the great resignation. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. and, and, and somebody pointed out, it's 2.9% of the workforce, right? Um, of the formal workforce. So, so something's happening. And, and the way that I, that I, I think it's, there are many ways to frame it. People talk about the great resignation, I think the great reshuffle is a very good way of looking at it. I've, I've, I've been talking about 2022 as the year of musical chairs. Everybody's moving to another chair. But I think another way of looking at it, it comes from a, a Washington Post journalist, Heather Long, um, who, who calls this the great, re, great reassessment, mm. right? And the great reassessment is workers and employees asking themselves, is this what I want to do? Yeah. Is this the kind of work that I want? Do I have enough growth and career opportunity in the work that I'm doing? My company has told us what the hybrid policy is. Does that work for me? Right? You, you know, I mean, you told us that we're going 3-2. You know what? 3-2 doesn't really work for me. Right? Or, you know, my company says we have to come back five days a week. I'd love to do 3-2. Right? So, so there's, employees are telling us, right? And they've learned that they have a lot more choices than they previously thought because we all had to explore choices during the pandemic. And the challenge for us as business and HR leaders today is how are we going to lead and lean in to the great reassessment? What are we going to do differently in 2022 to create opportunity and growth in our companies? Because, uh, and this, this of course is fascinating to me because this is what we're focusing on at Gloat with talent market and career marketplaces. But I think the broader question is absolutely relevant and I'll summarize it this way. The research that we've done at Deloitte with MIT, the research that others have done, continue to point out that most employees tell us that they believe that they have better and more accessible opportunities for jobs and growth outside their organization than inside their organization. And that is continuing to play out in the great reassessment and the great reshuffle. And so the challenge for us in our businesses today is to create, whether it's an internal marketplace or some growth platform where your employees, women, underrepresented minorities, everybody can see opportunity and growth in the organization, right? And I, I, the real challenge when you identify a signal, as you pointed out in your question, is what are you going to do with the signal? But this is a strong signal that we're getting in the great reassessment and the great reassessment. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And I think the signal connects back to uh, one of your earlier comments that as an organization or as leaders, we're not looking at only outputs and efficiency, but we are all as business also looking for new outcomes. So yeah. on the one hand, our employees are looking for that career opportunity and growth. And on the other hand, we as, as business, we also need 
that uh, opportunity and growth for for our new verticals, new customer lines, new new markets, new segments. Um, so how do we, you know, so you you spoke about marketplaces to fulfill the needs of of this potential desire from employees. But as business leaders, how do we create a a, a pivot to that innovation uh, in a way that it's little more, you know, it's still agile, but it's little more. It's not a one-off because of COVID, but it's a new way of doing business. Yeah. yeah. So I think this, um, uh, our colleagues at BCG, Boston Consulting Group, I think they have the best phrase for this, Esther. Yeah. So some people talk about new normal and next normal. Yeah. Um, BCG, I had an opportunity to, to present to some of their leaders uh, recently. BCG talks about the new realities of the 2020s. Okay. And I, I like that phrase because if there are new realities in the decade, mm-hmm. we probably need to be doing some things differently. We yeah. need to be stopping doing some things, starting doing some things, adding some new things to the mix. And that, and I think this is the challenge that we have right now, right? Um, the way that I, the question that I'm asking business and HR leaders today is as we're finishing 2021 and we're going into 2022, which is, I don't want to call it a normal year, but a year where we are not consumed only by COVID or primarily by COVID. Very interesting question is, where do you want to be in your business and people strategy at the end of 2022? What do you want to be able to look back? It's January, 2023, and let's say you're the head of HR and talent or the head of a business group, and you're looking at people strategy, which is my focus, and you're talking to the board or the CEO, what do you want to say, you know, here's the one or two things that we did in 2022 that really made a difference, right? That changed the way that we operate, that helped us in the great reshuffle and the great resignation and the great reassessment, right? Yeah. Again, I that's why I'm so excited about the concept of internal marketplaces. Also, we're, we're doing research and writing a book with some colleagues at, at Slow Management Review on um, on workforce ecosystems, right? Because, I shouldn't say because, um, one of the biggest reframing moments we have now is, is how we think about careers and how we think about the workforce, right? And for many years, we have been administering the workforce, right? The way that the image that I like to think about, hopefully it's useful, Esther, is you know, HR is the is the chess master moving the chess pieces on the board. And the chess pieces are our employees. And one of the things that we have learned, which we should not be surprised at, is that the chess pieces are actually alive. But our employees not are don't want to do what we think that they can do, right? If we hire you today in most organizations, we think that you are what we hired you to do. We think you are the jobs that you've already done in our organization, but we are all much greater than that because we can learn and we have interests, right? And I think one of the shifts that we're seeing now, right, is how do we create an environment that's based on marketplace dynamics, using AI to implement those dynamics so that our employees can tell us what they want to do, that our business managers can tell us the work and the projects they want to get done, And the other interesting thing about marketplaces is marketplaces produce information, right? They're one of the richest sources of information. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that we want the marketplace to run amok, right? There's some combination. We want to administer it. We want to actually orchestrate it. That's the word that I use. But if we can recognize that our employees are animated, our employees have interests, And if we allow our employees to bring their potential and interest to the business problems we have, they will stay because they will have more opportunity. And as you've said in your earlier part of your question, we'll have the innovation and the growth and the dynamism that we're looking for. But this is a big shift because most of our people practices are based on administrative transactional system of record linear practices, right? And we're trying to move from that into a marketplace and an ecosystem dynamic. Thank you, Jeff. And I'm, I have my last two questions and, and I, I hope we had more time with you, but we may have to do a follow-up interview with your permission. But I have happy, two more questions. Happy to. Thank mm-hmm. you so much. So one is, uh, you mentioned before about this new opportunity of the three 
dimensions of work, worker and workplace uh, as, a, as an opportunity for diverse uh, talent. And, and I'm interested to hear your viewpoint, especially when it comes to inclusion, uh, yeah. because while we may have access to more diverse talent, I think the big challenge that we have and we've always had is to tap into the, the potential of that diverse voice. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what you see in terms of, um, of uh, uh, what will evolve, especially on inclusion. Yeah, so um, what, it's a really interesting question. So what will evolve in large part is a function of what we want to have happen. Yeah. One of the, when I, when I was writing my book, um, I interviewed uh, Lewis Hyman as a professor at Cornell's Labor Relations School on, on the temp economy. And um, I asked him a similar question. I said, so Lewis, what's going to happen to the workforce? Is it going to be mainly temporary workers? Is it going to be mainly full-time workers? And, and what Lewis said, which really stuck with me is, well, nothing is predetermined, right? Um, so I can tell you what the trends are, but what's more interesting and it really made me stop and think, and hopefully it will make our listeners and readers stop and think, is we have choices, right? And, and we are at a moment now of choice and consequence around diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And, and some of it is because of the way the issue has been raised um, uh, socially and how it's um, been brought up um, to our attention um, in our communities and, and in our regions and our countries and in our companies. Um, and some of it is because we've, we've seen some things, some good and some bad in the last year and a half that have actually given us a whole new way of thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? There, there's some really big, there's some challenges we're seeing around the world around, particularly how women in the workforce can uh, take care of children and, and, and other members of the family and how important that is to the productivity and the inclusion of women in the workforce. But we were talking a few minutes ago about being in this virtual work and this hybrid world. And that allows us to have people who historically were not involved because of where they live or because of the communities that they've been part of to participate in our organizations, right? The economist in me would say, we have more options and degrees of freedom than we ever had before, right? We can, we can work remotely, we can work um, in hybrid ways. We can use marketplaces without gender and other um, and uh, uh, cultural identifiers to help us find talent in our organizations, right? These are all good things. The question is, are we going to take advantage of them, right? All right. And, and I think the, 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 the action point here is it's much more, it's a combination of deciding what you want to do, having a, a clear policy choice, as Lewis said, and then putting in place the technologies and the new programs to actually get it done. I think it's, you can't just state a policy and communicate it. You can't just implement a new platform or a new technology. You need to do both. You need a clear direction and then you need to actually put the tools and the resources behind it to do it. And I think we're seeing people start to do that. I would summarize it by saying I'm cautiously optimistic, but we have to do something to make this happen. I'll, I'll, one of my favorite quotes is, I started with Albert Einstein, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll add one from, um, from Elvis Presley, who said, who's one of his songs is uh, something like, a little, less, a little less talk and a little more action, is I think yeah. what we need in some of these Very areas. nice, very nice. And yesterday I was uh, hearing an a interview with uh, Amy Edmondson and Thomas Chamorro, and what yeah. stood up for me from that and connecting it with what you're saying is that they were talking about it's not what we want to have happen, but it's what we need. And it was very interesting because sometimes what we want and what we need may be different. And, and I think the diversity inclusion conversation sometimes it's, it's, it may not be what we want because we have our own you know, biases and our own uh, situations and our own backgrounds, but it, it may be what we need. And I love that distinction. That yeah. it's not what we want, but it's what we need. Uh, as, well, I, as, I love as that, and I think I think what's interesting where we are today is what we want and what we need, and what is possible. Yeah, is a yeah. really interesting combination. Very nicely um, said. Very nicely said. Beautiful, wonderful. So my last question, Jeff, is going to be 
um, and, and you've already answered it in some parts as we go through the conversation, but your closing word of advice for especially the CHRO community who are going to be listening and reading these piece, uh, one star, one stop uh, that you like to leave with all of us today as we design yeah. this uh, work in the 21st century. So absolutely. So um, look, uh, uh, many we have heard from from many commentators. Probably you've talked about this, Esther. That that this crisis, which has been at least three crises, um, has been an incredible moment for chief human resource officers and the HR community. Um, others have said that you know in in the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, the CFO came to the rescue, and in many ways in the in the, the health and the economic and the social crises of, of, of 2020 and 2021, it was the CHRO. Um, we are all incredibly grateful. We're also very tired for what we've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, but I think, I think the next act, what we do in 2022 in the next few years is, is, is an amazing opportunity. Um, if you know, one of the threads running through today's discussion is that redefining and reframing and re-architecting, as we talk about it at Deloitte, work and workforces and workplaces, that is the challenge of the 2020s. And the CHRO, see, he, they can be really at the forefront here. Um, and it's how do we shift from a sort of crisis response mode where we were amazing into a much more creative, proactive, um, redesigning role, which I think is the challenge now. You, you've called it opportunity. I think the opportunity is there. Either the HR community will lead or the HR community will support. I hope HR leaders are preparing and are really pushing to lead. Um, it's going to be uh, an amazing time of, of, of reframing, of redesigning across work, workforces and workplaces. Um, uh, it gives me a lot of energy to end on that note. And I, again, I really appreciate the time today, Esther. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. And we've had the opportunity to be with Jeff Sword, a Senior Advisor, Future of Work, Deloitte, and Vice President Insights and Impact at Glute and author of Work Disrupted. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being with us today. Mm -hmm.